with at Research Park and the kind of companies that we might be able to work for um, when we do graduate. So Jenny, I'll leave it up to you to kind of um, lead us now through um, the panel discussion and then it'll be open for Q&A for anyone who has questions for um, the employees who were able to um, be with us today. Great, thank you very much. Um, so thanks everyone for um, inviting us the research park to, to join your event and we're glad that you're all able to join us today. Uh, my name is Jenny Kim. I'm the assistant director for talent at the research park. Um, and my main role is to help employers all of the companies in the research park to build up their workforce, um, whether that be student or full-time. And so I help them to connect with the campus and the community. And then on the flip side of that, make sure that the campus and community are aware of all of the different opportunities that are available in the research park. Um, so a big part of that is to coordinate events like this, where you um, get to hear from the employers themselves about what they're doing and um, what types of internships they might have available, but most importantly, kind of just what is the cool work that they're doing um, in the research park locations. So before we get started, I'm going to um, share my screen real quick and just give you a brief overview of uh, what the research park is. So if you're, you may have heard of it um, and you know, you kind of know what's going on there, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page before we get started. Uh, but basically research park is a technology hub. It's a place where um, startups uh, are cultivated and it helps to accelerate corporate innovation. There are actually over 120 companies in the research park and they range from the small startups to large fortune 500s. The best thing about the research park being right here on campus is that they are able to offer internships all year round. So part-time during the school year and full-time in the summer. Um, and there are over 2,200 employees that are both uh, uh, full-time and interns across the entire park. Uh, these companies, they hire freshmen to PhD, domestic and international students. They employ students from all majors and all colleges. There's really skills and experience-based hiring. Um, then, and they're all paid internships as well. Uh, when we are able to be on site, uh, Research Park is easily accessible by bus, bike, and uh, very rare on campus, but there's free parking available as well there. So we're hoping that this summer uh, we'll be able to be, more sites will be able to be on uh, on site and in their offices, but right now uh, there's it's pretty much virtual hybrid model. Um, a few events. We also have another panel coming up this Friday on February 26th from 12 to 1 p.m. So if you're interested in hearing from um, some other employers, um, please feel free to join us for that. Um, and one of our biggest events is next week. Can't believe it's only a week away, but we have our big research park career fair. That is Tuesday, March 2nd from 3 to 7 p.m. This will be virtual via Zoom. So we have one main Zoom link that you will enter um, kind of like a lobby, and then we will give you instructions on how you meet um, with the other employers. Uh, we look forward to meeting our sponsors, PNG Smart Lab, uh, Motorola Solutions, and Corteva AgriSciences and Granular. We have other companies as well joining us, but <clears throat> you can definitely look forward to meeting with uh, several of the research park companies at that event. Uh, the following week, uh, Wednesday, March 10th, we also have our Ag Tech Innovation Summit. So if you are interested in the intersection of agriculture and technology, uh, please join us for that summit. It's a free summit. There's some really great panels throughout the day. And then in the right after that summit from 4.30 to 6 p.m., we are going to have a specific ag tech innovation career mixer. So this will be an opportunity to connect with companies that are using technology to transform the agricultural industry. If you have more questions, um, feel free to stop by and pop into our research park office hours. This will be every Thursday. This, so the, the, we have one coming up this Thursday, um, 12 to 1 p.m. Check out our calendar and um, there's just a Zoom link and uh, you, there's no registration or anything required. Feel free to ask us any questions that you have about the research park. I will pop in some of these links as well as uh, we go through the panel today. Um, but then the last thing I wanna share is just, you know, feel free to follow us on social media. We also have a student newsletter that goes out to help keep you up to date on the different events that we have. And you can also always email us at uirp-jobs at illinois.edu. All right, so that was my little, little plug for Research Park and just so that everybody understands what Research Park is. Um, 
but we want to hear from the employers. And so that's why you're here today. So we have some great research park employers with us today. I am going to let them um, introduce themselves as we go through. I am, I have some questions prepared, but if you do have questions at any point, feel free to put them into the chat and I will either ask them out loud or ask you to unmute and ask yourselves. We really want this to be about you because um, you know they're, they're here to, um, tell you about what they're doing and who they're looking for. So um, please feel free to, to put questions into the chat at any point. All right. So as we begin, if um, we can go ahead and maybe start with April, if you could introduce yourself and your company, kind of what does your company do? What does your company do specifically in the research park, if that's different? Um, you know, and then a little bit about yourself. What is your position and what is your background? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jenny. So my name is April Hoffert. Uh, I am a, I'm the um, modeling capability manager for ADM. Um, so what ADM does, we are a global agricultural processor. So we take uh, agricultural feedstocks, corn, beans, uh, or corn, soybeans, uh, many different things and turn them into uh, various food, food additives, chemicals. Um, we really, uh, are a across the board uh, egg manufacturer. Um, I am a chemical engineer by training. I've been with ADM for 15, almost 16 years now. Um, I started out working in a plant at ADM. I worked at a soybean oil refinery. Uh, I then moved on to um, making uh, margarine and shortening in a, a margarine and shortening plant a, where we also did packaging. So uh, we were making basically uh, shortening and margarine for like food service. So restaurants, um, generally most of our, our customers are, are larger kind of middlemen, uh, so to speak. Uh, very little of our stuff goes direct to consumer. Um, and then in 2010, I, I transferred to research. So I've been at research in process development ever since then. And what I'm doing at um, Research Park and what my group is doing at Research Park is we do process and financial modeling. Um, so what that means is we uh, try to identify the, um, what the process looks like chemical, from a chemical engineering perspective, what the process will look like in, uh, in a commercial facility. So uh, developing new commercial uh, manufacturing processes, uh, trying to optimize those processes, find the best financial, um, outcomes for expanding our business or improving the businesses that we're currently in. Great. And next, Tim. Sorry, let me unmute there. Uh, yeah, I'm Tim, Tim Chapman. I'm with uh, Abbott. Um, I've been actually with Abbott for almost 20, going on 20 years now. And I've been uh, that whole time with Abbott Nutrition, but at Research Park, uh, we recently expanded outside of nutrition in the last little over a year now. Um, so Abbott uh, has uh, companies uh, or divisions with nutrition, uh, diabetes care, vascular, um, and uh, a lot of other different medical devices. Um, and so what we do is we, I, I'm in charge of uh, gathering uh, projects from all these different divisions and then uh, hiring uh, students uh, to support these. So you, we ask students to work one-on-one -on -one with a scientist or an engineer in, in those different divisions. Um, with, with this, what, what we've seen is uh, increase using outside of just nutrition, um, ability to uh, interact with uh, a lot of engineering students, a lot of uh, um, different, different businesses. Uh, we've also done a lot with our corporate IT recently. So we're really getting a lot of projects uh, kind of around that, um, looking at uh, developing apps and things like that to be used inside our businesses. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about uh, Abbott. Great, and next Meg from Caterpillar. Hi there, my name is Meg Kleinfeld and I work at Caterpillar. Currently I am working from home. Um, if I was not working from home, I'd be in the Aurora facility. And I got started working with Caterpillar actually through the research park. 
uh, my first internship started when I was an undergrad and I also worked with Caterpillar during graduate school. A little bit about Caterpillar, we make mining and construction equipment. Uh, we've also partnered with Solar uh, for their turbines and Progress Rail is another partner that we have. I have the title of an analysis lead with virtual project development for the large structures. And I mainly work on the large wheel loaders. So those are the machines that have the bucket in front and the four wheels. And I get to focus on the frame and uh, the lift arm that holds up the bucket and the bucket itself. Uh, been working a lot over the past year with uh, collecting customer data. And uh, that's been really interesting to be able to instrument a machine and then have data pull through either through cell towers, so it's over the cloud or directly under the machine and be able to see strain traces and videos and all those kinds of things. Um, what does Caterpillar do at Research Park? It's a little different, uh, depends on which group you're working with. We've got a um, a diverse set of groups, like all grouped together at the Shannon Payne Innovation Center. And you can range from doing analytics to working on virtual product development. Um, gosh, you could even do design work if you'd like to. What's really great is that working at Research Park, I found like with Caterpillar, they can get you connected with all the different facilities and you can get a nice flavor of what you might be interested in the future for your full-time role. That's a bit about me and Caterpillar. Great, thank you very much. And Mary Kate. Sure. I um, just want to make sure you guys can hear me okay. I removed my mic. Do I sound any better? Yes. Perfect. Um, yes, I can cover what Motorola Solutions does, and then I'll turn it over to Craig to kind of discuss what we do at Ruth Park. Um, so Motorola Solutions, if you think of mission critical communications, um, that is exactly what we do whether it's through land mobile radio. So you, you think of police officers or firefighters or EMT, um, the radios they use and the infrastructures the radios run on. Um, we also have uh, command center software suite. So that's 911 call handling, um, computer aid dispatch. And then additionally, we recently through numerous acquisitions have broken into the video and security arena, um, including analytics that pair up with that as well. Um, so really exciting stuff that we do, really meaningful work. Really, you know, the mission that we have is to make communities safer um, and, you know, make sure they're striving. And I guess from a research park perspective, I can turn it over to Craig and he can kind of share um, what we do there. Sure, but you didn't introduce yourself, Mary Kate. Introduce yourself. As oh, well. sorry. <laughs> I'm Mary Kate Bryant. Um, I'm the University Relations Lead at Motorola Solutions. I work really closely with Craig to bring in um, talent from U of I, both in an internship and like new grad perspective. So we're always really excited to partner with U of I and Research Park to make sure we bring in the best, best and brightest talent. Nice. And I'm Craig Ibbotson. I'm the research director for Motorola Solutions here at Research Park. U of I alum, graduated in computer science. Um, bleed orange and blue. Uh, so here at Research Park, you know, largely software driven projects. Um, we do have some business oriented projects, but largely software, cloud computing, real time embedded software, mobile application development, a lot with cybersecurity analytics, um, using all the latest modern software methodologies and processes. Everything we do is agile development. Uh, and most of the things that we're doing are deployed in the cloud at scale. So lots of really interesting uh, projects here. And we have students from undergrad through PhD working with us now on the projects that we have. Right now we have um, 43 students working with us this semester. All right, great. Thank you so much. A nice variety of industries that we have represented, uh, lots of different roles. So that's that's also one of the greatest thing, great things about Research Park is that uh, there's a lot of opportunity in a lot of different areas. Um, so I was hoping that you could each tell us what is the best thing about working for your company and what is your favorite thing about your specific role or position? And maybe we can start with Meg. Jumping off of mute there. How's the audio? Good? Yes, okay. So the best thing about working at my company, I would say is the relationships that you're able to form with your teammates. I've been lucky enough to have been on so many good teams and I you know, still carry those relationships through from role to role. Um, it seems that 
over the course of the years. And I started my internship in 2007, started full-time in 2012. It seemed like every two years or so, I'd be moving on to another team and all of that. So uh, what I enjoy is that as I start on a new team, there's a lot of camaraderie and help. And I always know that I can reach out uh, to understand, to learn, that sort of thing. And my favorite role about my position right now would be that I get to have the flexibility to do kind of whatever I want. I don't know, it's so broad, like being, being in this analysis lead position, you get to interact with different product groups. So I work with uh, large wheel loaders, I work with underground mining or hard rock vehicles, and I work with wheel dozers and compactors. So there's a lot of programs going on. And when you get that overhead, you can pull from one program to another and see if you can like add synergies between the two um, and then also like make things more efficient, that sort of thing. So um, I think a piece with that and probably why I like the team aspect and, and then the working together is um, I've found that communication and learning good communication has really helped a lot. In fact, I, um, I pre-ordered this book about getting better at digital communication since we're all working remote. And I just, you know, I really want to improve that. And it's just a little bit there. Great, thank you very much. And Tim? Sure, um, working with uh, Abbott, I think, um, it, yes, the teams. I also think it's also some of ours is, um, I always tell the story, I worked a lot in product development and nutrition and we would have, um, actually I worked a lot with ADM. <laughs> But we would have uh, meetings with uh, different suppliers and things. And one of the things that always struck me is you'd go around and you'd introduce yourself and say how long you've been with the company. And they'd get to me and I might say 10 years with Abbott. And I would be by far the lowest, the least senior person there at 10 years. Um, I mean, a lot of times, a lot of people at uh, our company seem it's nothing to hear. Somebody's been there 20, 30 years. And I, and I think it's got to do a lot with the culture, um, a lot of the culture and a lot of the um, what, what we're getting to, to make because um, again, nutrition, you know, we're working on infant formula all the way up to um, helping people on, on ventilators and things like that. Uh, some of the other uh, divisions are working with a lot of medical devices and things. So I just think it's, it's that kind of culture that's uh, been, been great. Now, as far as my current role, one of the things I've really enjoyed is, again, I've been with Abbott for 20 years and I've I know the nutrition business, but it's learning all the other businesses. And then also, honestly, it's, it's working with uh, some of the students and, and learning what, what they're, what's new out there and what they're doing. Uh, I, one, of my, uh, one of the best things I get to do in my job is try and help uh, students connect with, um, with, with, other, with full-time jobs if, if we can. I mean, that's, that's one of the, uh, I, know, I know Craig and I'm sure he'll, he'll say the same. That's one of the best things is when you can see somebody get a, get a job. Uh, you know, and, and help them do that. So that, that's one of my favorite things to do. All right, great. And I think that's a good segue to either Craig and Mary Kate, kind of what, what do you love about motorless? Let me, Mary Kate take this one. Yeah, sure. Um, it's a really good question because I really like a lot of things about our organization. But I think the number one thing that I like about Motorola Solutions is um, our mission. So the work that we do, at least I feel, is extremely meaningful. I kind of talked earlier how mission critical communications is kind of what we do um, at a high level. So if you think of someone calling 911, someone relying on help from a firefighter or a police officer, um, if the communication tools that they're using aren't working, they're in trouble. You know, they are in danger, their, their life could be you know, at risk. And so to me, the fact that we keep these communities safe makes the work that I do extremely, extremely meaningful. And I can tell too that my coworkers agree with me and they are coming into work and we're all doing meaningful work and working together. So I would say our mission is, you know, to what I love most about the organization as a whole. And then my job, um, kind of to echo what Tim said, is I just love being able to connect with students. Um, I learn from them. They never cease to amaze me the type of work they do. I'll sit in and on some demos um, at, from our research park students. And I'm absolutely mind blown that they're only a sophomore in college. I you know, love working with students. It makes my 
day super exciting and again, super meaningful helping them get that job or that internship. Great, thank you. And anything to add there, Craig? Oh, sorry. I, I'm going to just echo what Tim said. I mean, one of the big, best things for me coming back to campus is getting to work with the amazing students. I mean, you know, I in the morning and in the afternoon, I get to work with students that are way smarter than me, so it humbles me. And then I get to go walk on the quad. I mean, it's like the best job in the world. So I'm pretty happy being back on campus here. So. Great, thank you. And April. Sorry, I was having problems with my mute button. Um, yeah, so uh, best thing about ADM, um, you know, working for ADM, there's so much um, diversity in what you can do. Um, you know, ADM is all over the world. Um, I have colleagues, uh, I have colleagues right now who are uh, being transferred out of the country to work on new construction projects. Uh, one person is going to Bulgaria. Uh, one person just came back from China. Um, it's I've known people who have helped build uh, facilities in South America. Um, if you are uh, if you are driven and um, take kind of take responsibility for your career and show your enthusiasm and skill, uh, ADM will um, will absolutely. Uh, work with you and and help you advance your career. Um, and if you express interest in in you know going outside of the country, uh, things like that, there are definitely opportunities to do that. Um, there's also opportunities. You know, I have a lot of people who start in engineering, uh, who start in the plants like I did, but then decide, you know, I would really like more of a customer facing role. Uh, and so we have. Um, we have engineers that um, become um, technical service reps um, that work directly with the customers for applications uh, of our project of our product. So um, it's so diverse in where you can take your career in ADM. Um, I mean, when I started in ADM, I had no idea I would end up in research and be the modeling center uh, capability manager for uh, the research process development group. It's something that I have always enjoyed um, doing new process development. Um, even starting in the plant, I um, always liked to work on the project to do new things at the plant, you know, not necessarily the stuff that we do every day. Um, in, in my current role, uh, the, my favorite thing about my current role, I mean, I feel like I'm just copying everybody else because I think we have a lot of the same uh, sentiments um, I also love, I mean, I've been out of school. It doesn't seem like a long time, but it seems like a long time <laughs> to be out of school for 16 years. Um, but I, you know, when you, when you get into a new position, you kind of get focused on what you need to do for that position. And maybe you forget some of the stuff that you learn in school and seeing students, uh, come into the office and be able to tackle these really complex problems um, to optimize some of the issues that we're seeing in some of the plants uh, makes me really excited and proud um, to be working with them. Um, I also really like that even within our, you know, even though we're our, our research, um, I guess, sub subunit, um, we focus on current running manufacturing plants. So, uh, we might have one of the technology engineers emailing us one day and saying, you know what, we're having really a lot of problems with our SO2 scrubber. Um, we really need you guys to model it so that we can see what's happening um, and we can compare what we're getting in real time to what maybe we should be expecting from it. And, and being able to make those really um, meaningful changes to, to help improve an existing process is really, uh, it's really exciting to do. Great, thank you so much for sharing everyone. Um, so you've all mentioned how exciting it's been to see student projects. So I'm curious, what is it that, so how do you find these students, right? So what is it that students can do to stand out on an application or an interview or in a networking event? It's kind of like, what are you looking for that kind of to, 
to find those students that are going to be doing these amazing projects for you. And, and maybe if we can start with April. Yeah, sure. Uh, it was I was actually going to offer to jump in because we are we are in the middle of recruiting right now. Um, so one of the so when I'm recruiting for this position, um, I definitely look for people who are you know very self motivated, um, who take pride in their work, who are high achievers, um, but they have to they have to have a initiative and excellent communication. Um, you know, we certainly work with the students to help um, hone that communication in a corporate setting. Um, and I think that's one of the, the big benefits that a lot of people take away. Our research organization sits um, very high up on the kind of um, chain of command in the company. So working at this location, uh, we have student interns who are in meetings with VPs. Uh, we've had student interns who are in meetings with the CSO. Um, so, you know, making sure that those communications are professional and um, efficient uh, is really important to us. Um, but aside from that, I mean, just we, we really like to have fun. Um, so having somebody, you know, with a good personality who likes to interact, we, everything that we do is really team-based. Um, so most of the time, nobody's working on anything by themselves. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, those are the main things, um, you know, communication, uh, enthusiasm, uh, drive, and initiative. And actually, if we could add one piece to that, um, with graduate students, is there something that you're specifically looking for that's different than with undergraduate students? Um, for graduate students, uh, it, it's I guess it's tricky for engineering uh, for me because um, you know most most engineers that we look for in in our organization I would consider generalists. Um, so as far as chemical engineering, you know. Uh, we aren't necessarily always looking for a reaction engineer or you know a very specific um, I guess subset of chemical engineering. Um, but some sometimes we are. I mean we just we just hired a reaction engineering specialist, for example. Um, but that was somebody with lots of lots of experience. Um, those those for for graduate students, the the things that come up are, they vary, right? So sometimes we're looking for, uh, in fact, I know coming up this summer, we're going to be looking for uh, maybe a graduate student who has um, experience with um, computational fluid dynamics modeling. And so that, you know, those are more specific things that we would be looking for somebody with more specialized expertise in some area. Okay, great. And Tim, how about at Abbott? Um. Yeah, so when I, I the echo at April said, we're, we're looking for someone that shows initiative. Um, uh, I, I, and both both for internships and also when they're looking for full time roles, one of the things I always tell students and um, so if you're looking at an internship here, reach out, ask, you know, once you apply also, you know, don't feel afraid to contact me through email or something and say, can I set up a, a 30 minute you know, just talk about what what this position is. Um, in fact, a lot of the a lot of times when we're when I'm looking at students, uh, I, I've had a lot of students do that um, during during the year. Maybe maybe I don't have a position, but they've contacted me, and then once I have a position coming open, I'll let them know, hey, this position's open, and you know, kind of just building that relationship. Um, so so that that helps a lot. As far as uh, graduate. Uh, it's going to depend on our projects, but typically what we're looking for is um, some kind of uh, expertise and a lot of ours is literature based reviews and, and writing and uh, communication and stuff like that. Um, and then as far as uh, like, like I said, we've recently started working with our corporate IT. They're looking at some of the um, coding and things like that, that maybe a graduate student would have a higher level in um, to help to help lead lead team doing that. Maybe um, typically most of our projects are one-on-one, -on -one, but we've started going to a couple of teams. So we're looking maybe as a graduate student to lead that uh, that team. 
Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, So my advice would be to, to be able to articulate during your interview how you affected that example. What was your role? A lot of times when I'm doing interviews, you get to hear this famous example, then you ask, well, what, what was your part in it? And if it's a flop, it's a flop, and you can, you can really tell. So um, be mindful about those examples that you bring up during your interviews so that um, you come across as your best self with, with these examples of you taking the lead or you being the success, that sort of thing. And then uh, the other part of the question was, what is Caterpillar looking for for undergrad and graduate students? So what is super great about the research park setup with Caterpillar and the University of Illinois is that Caterpillar understands your courses come first and they're totally flexible with your schedule in order to accommodate going to lectures, labs, discussions, fitting in that study time, but then also coming into the office. So they'll have you match up some core hours. And um, so being able to, again, articulate, you know, what, what you need from Caterpillar and what they can do to help, um, that'll definitely help you as you get started. Um, specifically with um, graduate students, I'd have to echo, echo the other panelists with, you would be hired to do a very specific role um, just because you've done all that work, right, on your thesis. Uh, so be ready to talk through all of that. I know you're not supposed to ask about your thesis, but be ready to talk about it with, <laughs> with the interviewer. All right, great advice. Definitely want to highlight projects that you yourself have worked on and can speak, speak about mm -hmm. um, your particular role. Um, and anything uh, additional there at Motorola Solutions? Well, I can add a couple things and turn it over to, to Mary Kate. I guess one thing for, and it kind of goes along with what Mike was saying, you know, the first, your first step in the door is your resume. So it's really important, um, even if you don't have a lot of work experience, you have a lot of project experience, right? Especially if you're a grad student. And having project experience on your resume is way more value than any maybe experience that you had with a job that wasn't relevant to your career because what we're looking for is something we can talk to you about and so having that on there really so if you're not if you're actually finding that you're not getting interviews then look at your resume and actually just you know do i need to revamp my resume to really focus on project work i can't tell you how many resumes i've gotten where somebody lists you know the first thing that they have is where is work experience at taco bell i'm not saying there's anything wrong with taco bell i love a chalupa but I mean, it's not really gonna help me in terms of recruiting, right? And asking the right questions. So make sure you have relevant project experience to the kind of work that you wanna do on there. Cause it, it doesn't matter to me if it's work or if it's something that you did in class, that's great. Just gives me a, a springboard to talk about it. I'm gonna be super frank here because I'm talking to Sui is um, I've, I've probably, since I've been down here, I, don't, I haven't actually kept count. I've interviewed hundreds and hundreds of students and I've noticed, uh, I know that generalizations are always dangerous, but I noticed that uh, when I interview female engineers, they tend to undersell themselves compared to the male engineers. So, you know, I, example, one of the questions I always ask for my software students is to just, and this isn't a hiring decision question, but I'll ask them to, on a scale of one to five, tell me, tell me each coding language they're familiar with and how familiar they are. You know, you need to understand when somebody's asking you, what's the context of that? Are they asking you relative to you, to other students, relative to the whole population of coders in the universe? And what does a one mean? And what does a five mean? And I'll tell you, I'll have some students that come in and say that they're a five because compared to their two buddies, um, they're the best one. So I'm a five. And so be, be confident, be proud of the accomplishments you have and go in and sell yourself. Don't, don't go in and undersell yourself. Um, and then as far as grad students, the one other thing I would add is just, um, I'm looking for, you know, since you're grad students, a little more maturity, a little more leadership capability, some ability to, you know, teamwork, we're really big, we almost all the work we do is in teams. So, you know, uh, we expect our, our master students that we hire to have, you know, more leadership capabilities, not that you have training in that, but just to have that little element of maturity that will help in, uh, in the business there. I don't know if Mary Kate, if you have anything you want to add to what I said. Craig, you hit the two big ones I was going to touch on, which was confidence. Um, being confident in an interview will take you many places. Um, you know, even if you aren't sure of an answer, if you are able to, you know, provide a confident thought process that's 
enough for us. Um, and then teamwork, like you said, we really, you know, harp on teamwork, harp on being a team player. And of course, we'll lean on our grad students for a little bit more of leadership um, and the internship. Great, great. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so we do have a question from the audience. Kathleen asks, how does an internship or research park fit in with graduate studies? So are most internships during the summer or are they in addition to student research or are there collaborative projects that you are working on with the university? Do you mind who answers or do you want us to no, jump in uh, there? Yeah, whoever. <laughs> I'll take it first and then I'll, I'll throw it around. So I think, you know, Meg actually hit, uh, was when she said that, you know, your academic success is our first priority. Every company, uh, I don't know if any company that doesn't believe that and we will work around you. I find with my master's students, their, their schedules tend to be more flexible. So, you know, they'll have more time one week than another. And we all run our companies where the internships are part-time during the school year. I think we do, and then full time during the summer. So, um, you know, you know, generally, I, you know, up to no more than 20 hours a week, and I would say more realistically, like 15 hours a week during the school year. I find with my master's students, you know, some weeks they'll be like, you know, I don't think I can work at all, and then other weeks they'll be working maybe 30 hours just because their schedules are like that. So, I currently don't have any projects that are actually collaborative with the university. All the projects that we have our own. I know that's something that we continue to look in, and there might be opportunities like that, but but we don't have those. And then the, la uh, the last thing I would say, Kathleen, is we have internships both in the summer and during the school year. So in the summer, they're full-time and they're here at the office and during the school year, they're part-time, so. And Meg, it looks like. Yes, yeah, I'll jump in here. It was funny, I'm grabbing my mouse that's not connected to the device that we're talking with right now. So I was like waking it up. Yeah, so at Caterpillar, uh, the, the gig is during the summer, during the winter break and spring break, you're working full-time 40 hours. And then the expectation during the school year is if you're an undergrad, it's 10 hours a week. And if you're in grad school, it's 20 hours a week. So if you're already working on a grad school program, a thesis, fitting in those 20 hours, I imagine would be pretty tough. Um, when I went through it, I did my research assistantship through Caterpillar. So they uh, they funded my my grad school, and I like did my hours with them. So that worked out um, quite well, actually. And um, what was the other part of the question? Let me bring up the chat here. Um, or are there any project? Well, so you did do your oh, yeah. research assistantship through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I can think of one example that Caterpillar paired with the, the SWE group on campus, and they were working through this nice project, and they presented, presented it at the, um, the WE, I think it was WE 19 conference that was in Minneapolis. Um, so that was a joint venture between Caterpillar at Research Park specifically and the uh, SWE. Great. Tim? Yeah, um, at Abbott, uh, the way we work is we work um, typically eight, minimum of eight to up to a maximum of 19 hours a week uh, is what we ask during the school year. Um, and when we say that minimum, if it's, if you do go uh, past, or if you don't get eight, I mean, it's not like you're going to be in trouble or anything. It's just that that's what we normally average and, and see. So we um, we ask that, you know, you work with us and let us know if there's going to be problems, because there are times that we see where students say, hey, I have a, a lot of exams or, or projects coming up. I might not get my hours this week. You just let me know and your assignment manager know, and typically we can work around that. Um, now, ours is a little different because we keep that eight to 19 hours a week, even during the summer, too. So what we see a lot with our graduate students is they work about eight hours to 10 hours a week during uh, fall and spring. And then during summer, we see them all mainly around that 19 hours a week. Um, as far as uh, projects outside of, uh, we currently don't have any of those um, that I'm running. We do have some, I believe, with a couple of different engineering uh, uh, schools as far as capstone projects and things like that. And we've worked with uh, um, some other uh, student organizations. Um, we did a project with uh, uh, 
um, Illinois uh, business consultants um, last year. So, so it is a possibility. We just, those are more one-offs than, than the norm for us. Okay, great. And then April. Yeah, so for, for us, um, usually during school, um, we're pretty flexible, first I'll say. So usually during school, um, we ask that our students work 20 hours a week. Um, I find that if you work less than that, it's really hard to stay engaged in your project. Um, there are potential opportunities for people to work less than that if we have, you know, smaller um, just single problems that need to be solved, but uh, most most of the interns are assigned to projects which are long term. Um, and uh, it, 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 it's really hard to stay engaged if you're if you're not working uh, at least, you know, parts are 20 hours a week. Um, most of the people that work for us will go to full time during the summer, may or may not go to full time during breaks. Again, we're very flexible about that. Uh, if you want to switch to full time during those periods, um, we definitely would have to work for you. Um, our internships are limited to six months of full-time work. Um, there are, ours are a little um, maybe different than most. So we don't necessarily just hire for a semester or you know a, a very specific period of time. Um, we are generally um, hiring for a minimum of six months. And then if people want to stay on past that, you know if let's say you start in February and uh, after your six months are up, you don't, um, you haven't found full-time job yet or you like working there, you wanna stay on, um, you can stay on, but you have to drop down to part-time at that point. So um, they're just limited to, to uh, six months of full-time work. Um, and it would effectively be unlimited for part-time work, but most people, uh, most people with engineering degrees don't want to stay in a, a, a part-time job for, for uh, an un, uh, undefined period of time. Uh, it's just, I, I just bring it up because it's something that we've been dealing with with COVID, right? So we have a lot of people that have stayed on a little longer because it's difficult to um, get um, difficult. It's been more difficult to get full-time work right now. Um, uh, what was the other part of the question? Oh, we don't, our group doesn't currently have any projects with the university. However, that is something that I am trying to develop. Um, so I would love to have more um, kind of collaboration between our, uh, between our uh, modeling center and say the chemical engineering department at the university, for example. Um, that that's something that we are are trying to expand. Um, so hopefully next year, if we have this again, my answer will be different to that. <laughs> yes, I know. I know that there are several uh, sites within the research park that are interested in more of that collaborative projects, but there's a lot of red tape behind it, and so I think that's that's where some of that difficulty lies. Um, but you'll notice that all of the companies, unfortunately, the answer to that is like, it depends, right? So all of the companies, you know, they all have different models. They all do hire independently. So you do have to apply to each company separately. And that's a great question to ask in terms of just getting, um, making that connection and finding out, you know, what's going to work for you and what's going to work for the company. I think you'll find that it might be on the student side on your side with uh, talking with your advisor in terms of what time and flexibility there is in your own graduate studies. Um, most of the companies at the research park, you know, they understand that you're students, that they that they are um, tapping into this amazing talent pool part time during the school year, typically full time in the summer. But again, that can be very different. Um, but they, you know, the key piece is communication that that you are able to communicate what your needs are, what your schedule is going to look like, and you know the, the companies are very understanding of that when when there is a lot of open communication, and that's that's been you know I think very a very successful model. So um, thank you for that question, Kathleen. Um, we are approaching like we're we're getting closer to the end, so I do want to open it up for student questions that that you have. Uh, is there we have this amazing panel of professionals. If you have 
any specific questions for any panelists or more uh, general questions for everyone? Um, so I have one. I, um, April, I think you had hit on it when you were saying how when you're in a company for so many years, you can sometimes forget some of the things that you learned in school. And then it's sometimes refreshing to have these students come in who are still kind of in the rigor of their coursework. Is there any things that you find that um, like maybe like a continuing ed? I know like medical professionals have to go through a continuing education, so many credits per year to kind of ke like keep up with what's going on in the field. Um, is there anything like that that's offered for like engineers when you're out in the workforce or have you found things that your company's offered to kind of keep up with what's going on in that field and what's new? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll say that my experience at the plant is a little different than my experience at research. I'm at the plant, most of your continuing education experience is on the job. Um, so it's kind of what you have to deal with day to day uh, and, and you kind of continue to learn it as, as things change. At research, we are um, a lot of the opportunity to take a, a course every, um, every year. Um, or, and when I say course, like a, a seminar or a, you know, like a training course, like I've taken several um, Aspen Plus, which is our modeling software, Aspen Plus training courses um, while being at research. Um, if you have, if you uh, get your PE, um, you have to have career development hours for that. And so ADM would certainly support, um, you know, allowing that. In addition to that, ADM will um, sponsor or help pay for um, advanced education. So if, for example, you have a master's and you want to go on and get your PhD um, and it is in line with what you're doing for ADM, um, then ADM would um, uh, would pay part of that for you to get your your your, your continuing education. It has to be a it has to be a degree focused um, venture. So you can't just take you know a class here and there um, for ADM to pay for it. As far as university level classes, um, yeah, that's that's basically it. <laughs> Did I answer your question? Did you have any? Yeah, no, that's that's really great. I, I guess I'm thinking in terms of like, would they also, I guess thinking in futuristically, would companies typically help you, I guess, pay for certificate programs? I know with the pandemic, I've been getting bombarded with like a lot of like Cornell has a leadership um, online certificate that you can take, but it's like $25,000 to enroll and things like that, would they, like if you were to propose something like that on how it would benefit the company, would they be willing to kind of help you? Yep, and that's the key right there, right? So you have to basically show show leadership. This is why I wanna take it. This is what it could bring for the company. Uh, and then, you know, it's up to leadership to say whether or not but those programs are in place. That, okay. that, that is something that happens, yep. Awesome, thank you. Yep. Is this similar at other companies, like Caterpillar? Uh, at Caterpillar, I've got a good example for professional development opportunities. I had never been to a suite conference before, and in 2018, I was nominated to go, and it was the best. It was the best thing. So my recommendation for specifically professional development would be to try and go to something like that. Uh, because there's a lot of sessions offered, so you get this chance to, to get a huge flavor of different types of techniques and strategies. And Great. Caterpillar will pay for you to go. Excellent. Especially yeah. if you're going for recruiting, they love that. Yeah, yeah. And also I would say that's a really great question to ask during an interview because it really shows that you have a growth mindset that you want mm -hmm. to continue to grow and that you, you know, typically with the defense of why you would want it and how it's gonna benefit the company. So um, that's a really great question. Similar programs at Abbott? Yeah, actually, um, it's funny. As I was, I've, we've been on this call, I just got an email about uh, sending out about the uh, SWE uh, National Conference for October um, and, you know, how, how you can sign up, sign up for that. Um, so, so it was kind of ironic. But yeah, I was going to say the uh, same thing is a lot of those uh, professional development opportunities, um, going to conferences like that, in fact, uh, we're encouraged to go to at least one conference a year. Now, um, also, 
uh, echo what uh, April said about um, being in the plant. Part of my job before is I have been in the plant and it is a little bit different. They're still told that, hey, you can go to a conference a year, but a lot of times that doesn't get to happen if you're inside the plant um, because of business needs. So you, you do do a lot of uh, on, on, uh, on the job training there. Um, they also, Abbott has a really good uh, um, lot of training that they offer just throughout the year. So um, outside of even like conferences and stuff like leadership uh, training and things like that, they have a leadership academy that you can kind of uh, become involved with and stuff like that. I guess one thing I would just add, Jenny, is just, um, you know, one of the things, especially we're focused on the software side, right? So the pace of change is so great that, um, you know, we're actually kind of view it as part of the job to con continually train. And so rather than motor, I mean, we used to have a giant education department that would create courses, but you, by the time you create a course, it would actually be outdated. So the idea now is as part of your job, you're continually signing up for courses and taking those courses because you might be assigned to a new project and all of a sudden you have to learn how to actually deploy into Kubernetes clusters or you know, things and, and things change at such a, a quick rate. And Mary Kay can talk about, it. I mean, certainly more traditional education programs exist and you get help with advanced degrees and all kinds of things like that. But I think one thing that's changed now, at least from when I first started is there's an expectation that you're continually re-educating yourself because the pace of change in technology now is just so rapid. Yeah, I agree with Craig. Um, there's definitely an emphasis on continual learning at Motorola Solutions from, you know, within, within your team or LinkedIn learning courses that you can take. Um, and then to his point, we do kind of have a more formalized um, learning program where you can seek out higher education or adjusting to your point if you want to you know, pursue a certificate, you know, the, the company will definitely help out with that. And of course, you know, the SWE conference is an awesome opportunity for you to go and develop and network with other female engineers. So we definitely are in a partnership with SWE at a, at a corporation level as well for the, the conference and other events too. All right, thank you so much. So we have just a few minutes left. I think we have time for one more question from the audience, if anybody would like to unmute and ask. All right, so I have actually a couple questions. One, one is the certificates that Justine mentioned, the like leadership certificates that you can get through the universities and how valuable how is it worth the money? I guess when you see that, is does that show initiative or? I'm just curious as as you're looking at hiring, you know, is that something that students should think about investing in? I I think it depends. Um, I think for the internship, uh, not necessarily. I I do I will notice. Um, I, I will say that when I look at it, when I look at a resume and it shows, you know, um, different certifications, it does, like to your point, uh, show initiative, right? These people have taken the time to go out and get this um, extra education above and beyond the coursework. Um, a lot of times for us, they're not really applicable. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily assist with their job but yeah it definitely does show initiative um but on the flip side if you see a resume that just has one after another you just start to feel like it's just a padding of a resume right and that maybe there could be more content in there that's more relevant for the job um you know that's another thing sorry i don't I like to always talk too much um the it when when i um when I look at a resume, a lot of people just make one resume and send it out, right? I think you should tailor your resume to the job. Um, so it's something that I didn't say at that earlier, but yeah, make sure that your resume is, is appropriate for the job that you're applying for and don't just send the same one to everybody that you're applying for. Yeah, that's definitely a great piece of advice. Um, you know, 
I think as students, you don't like to get generic messages from companies and the same way companies don't like to get generic uh, resumes or you know outreach from students, make sure that it's matching up. Help them if they're gonna get 100 resumes, the more that you can match it up, it's much easier to be like, oh, yep, we wanna interview this person. Yes, this makes sense. And then see where that leads from there. If they have to do a lot of work in terms of, well, first, if it's just generic, I'm, I'm like, oh, this is generic, I can tell, or, and move aside, or, um, it just takes a lot of work to try to match up what that experience might mean and what value it might bring to my company. And then it's just exhausting. So um, it's it's a lot easier if you are able to do that, those matching pieces. So great, great piece of advice there. Um, so one, one question that I wanna wrap up with today is just what is one thing you wish you knew in school before heading out into the, into the full-time workforce? Is there like a resource that you wish you took more advantage of or something that you had done? Um, maybe we can start with Craig. <laughs> oh, so that's a tough one to answer, but I guess, you know what? I think the interesting thing is this, this concept of continual education, um, I think is so important and it really wasn't emphasized to me when I started. And unfortunately, you know, I saw a lot of people that I started with who kind of got stuck in a technology paradigm from when they graduated college. And that works for a while, but eventually you become irrelevant. So, and, and that's where you end up having to kind of do a major retooling and trade training. So I think for me, it was, I, I wish I had known early on the need. Eventually I caught up, obviously I'm still here, but, but, uh, but you had to, you know, that is an important lesson, I think. Meg? Yeah, I'll jump in. Don't be, don't be afraid to negotiate that first job offer. Mm -hmm. I didn't, and I totally regret it because I had put all these years in working um, with Caterpillar and those weren't rolled into my years of service. So that's like, oh, I had leverage. I totally did. <laughs> and I didn't know that I could do that because I was so excited, right, to get a job offer and it was a great base salary. Uh, but really come to the table with uh, what you really want and with negotiations, know what you'll go down to. Great advice. Uh, April? Yeah, I was gonna basically say the same thing that Craig said. Um, you know, you, you get done with college and you think, oh, thank God I'm done with that. You know, now I can go and work. <laughs> and really it's just the beginning of your learning experience, right? You have to be open to learning new things, uh, open to, identifying for yourself what you like to do um, in your job and what brings you energy in your job and you know try to find those opportunities the other thing is um, always try to find a mentor um, especially for me like in a really big company um, it can be really overwhelming about who you can talk to and you know your boss might not be the best person to talk to it might not be the best mentor um, so seeing you know trying to seek out a mentor um, to kind of help you navigate your career, especially in the early years, uh, is really important. Great, and, and Tim. Yeah, well, there, there's two things. One, when, you, if, when you're talking about a job search, do remember to, you don't have to start your job right after you graduate. I made the mistake of I graduated on a Sunday and I started my first job on Monday. Take some time, enjoy it. Don't, don't do that. You have the rest of your life to work. So you know, don't, don't freak out about, oh, I need to get a job right away. Um, and then, and then the other thing is uh, just take, take advantage of your opportunities here. Um, and I know this sounds, but I, I look back to when I was in school, I went to University of Kentucky and Ohio State for my graduate. Look, we didn't have the opportunities that you do here, like, especially with like Research Park and come, you know, go there, talk to some of the people there um, look at getting an internship there. And sometimes it's, if you find something you say, I really didn't like that, that's just as good as finding out what, what you did like. I mean, that's one of the best things you can do. It's just learning what, what you want to do because once you get out into the workforce, you know, you'll be, you, you can move around and stuff like that, but it's, you know, you may be there a little bit longer, so. Great advice. Yes, I always, I always tell students that if you find something you don't want to do, that's one thing off your list that you're not gonna be exploring anymore. <laughs> it seems like there's a whole wide array of things you can do. So it's kind of nice to know that's that one. Um, but 
thank you so much, um, everyone, for um, all the great advice. Um, I think you you I think throughout you've heard a lot of commonalities, but you know everybody's got a different career path. Every company has something uh, different and valuable to offer. So you know really look for that fit. Um, Join us on Friday if you want to hear from some other employers um, about, we'll have some of the same employers, but we'll have a few different employers as well. Mm -hmm. um, but Research Park is a really great um, experiential learning opportunity that is available to you, an amazing resource that um, is really only available on our campus. So um, I hope that you learned a lot and that you will connect with us. I will um, share contact information with Justine um, is to distribute to your group, but um, I posted the, our tenant directory, which has research park company information, that actually has contact information for all of the managers of the sites in research park, and that is going to the person who's in Champaign, so um, take advantage of that, and remember, if you are going to reach out, make sure that person understands why, right, and it's not just, I want a job, it's not just hey, your company sounds interesting, and clearly it's the same email that has gone to every single company, um, do that matching. And that does really help you to stand out um, as a really strong, strong candidate. Um, so thanks so much for joining us and thank you to the panel. Thank you, Jenny, right. for putting this panel together. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, I did want to mention one quick thing, just in case anyone on this call wasn't aware, but uh, members of grad suite can apply for uh, scholarships to attend to attend the SWE conference every year. So uh, if you weren't aware of that, keep a lookout for that next fall. And um, we'll be uh, sending out emails with lunch winners from this week too.